the representative of uh, FAA safety team with FISDO 19. Join me tonight, Mr. Bill Weaver and Mr. Barry Bird, both of them our managers from the safety team, also Mr. Josue Tirado and all our volunteers with safety team. I want to mention tonight, we're going to give you WINGS. WINGS, it's the special program of FAA, which not just cheering you with education, also giving you benefits that when you're passing your biannual, you can get points, which, which will give you easier way in the oral questions and also other things if you get into violation wing seminar wing program will actually help you to get out of it um i would like to big thank to mr eddie wayman louis he is this is eddie uh he is the vice president of wayman aviation he also the president of business development and administration at north perry airport and Eddie made it possible uh, to have this Zoom tonight. He's the big help to us. Thank you so much, Eddie. Also, um, as you know, probably many of you knows that we tried to do that meeting twice before as a seminar, as a Zoom, and we couldn't do it to do COVID-19. So I would, I would like to thank, just to thank to our helper, uh, the Broward Dean of Transportation, Ms. Carla Pinto, and also the manager of Boca Raton Airport, Mr. Robert Abbott, for their big help. We did try, didn't work out, sorry about that. Um, in this seminar tonight, we will cover multiple subjects uh, connected to South Florida airspace, flying in and out, traffic awareness, and rather a uh, replay of traffic conflicts. We have a lot of conflicts. We will bring a variety of um, aspects of flying in class Bravo, Charlie, and Delta knowledge. Um, the knowledge needed and communication between pilots and controllers. Also, we will introduce the new transition called Red Road by the Creator, which is with us tonight, one of our speakers. Our instructors, we have one instructor, Eddie, and three different controllers. They will speak each of one of them about their own area of coverage. And our speakers tonight will be Eddie Wayman, he's not just owner of flight school, he's also instructor, and he will speak about um, what we're teaching new pilot and trying to repeat it to uh, pilots which flying many years, aviation language and the safety in the air because of the language. Um, the second one, the second speaker will be, will be Dyron Fernandez, he's from Miami Tracon. He will cover multiple subjects connect to South Florida airspace. And um, after him will become will come Nicolas Candelier, is also from Miami Tracon. And he will speak about variety of flying and class Bravo Charlie Delta. And as I mentioned, the creator of the Red Road, this is Nick himself. After them, the last speaker will be Cedric McQueen, is the manager of North Perry Tower with many years of experience. Um, Cedric is going to speak about the safety of the Hollywood Tower or a tower at all. Uh, safety between pilots and controllers and the language which we're using. We thank you again for joining us this evening and uh, we would love to take your questions as much as possible and our speakers will answer. Enjoy your evening. Eddie? Hello okay. and thank you. Hello and thank you Ziva and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this evening, giving us a slice of your uh, Thursday evening here. Uh, Communication is such an important topic. Of course, um, all of the controllers, myself, our school, Ziva, we're all here in South Florida, which is about as multicultural as it gets. Uh, you know, in our flight school, Wayman Aviation Academy, amongst our instructors, 
last time I polled, we speak about 11 languages, right? And uh, I'm not even sure how many languages our students speak, but the language, the, the, the language of aviation is English, right? IKO English, and uh, we test for that. And in, in all honesty, it sometimes is lacking on uh, pilots that are, that are here flying above us or students that are learning to fly here in South Florida. Many times I've been out in the practice area and heard Spanish and Portuguese and other languages that I'm not even sure what they are. Uh, of course, we wanna keep it all in English. And so I wanted to share with you just a few thoughts on, on what we do, right? So the schools are required to receive uh, students speaking uh, an advanced intermediate level of English, ICAO level four. For those of you that are not familiar, it's one to six uh, international civil aviation organizations, uh, English levels. One is no hablo inglés. Six is a fluent, not, a, not an issue uh, English speaker. Uh, level three is what I would consider an intermediate, somebody that it can speak and can be understood, but perhaps has trouble, is still translating in their head, has more hiccups. And four is definitely at a much more fluent operational level. So uh, we, most of our students, where English is not their native language, come to us with a three or four. Even a student that has perhaps been uh, at American or British high school in their home country doesn't have the opportunity to practice English like you do, you know, here going and, and ordering a hamburger or whatever it might be. Uh, that being said, the English we speak on the radio is not the, the same kind of English you would speak, uh, you know, ordering, ordering dinner. So we go through a lot of exercises. All of our students that come in, uh, you know, besides the basic English screening, will receive a full ground school in English, right? Uh, very important that all instruction happen in English in the cockpit, in the classroom. And then beyond that, uh, what I strongly recommend to anybody who is a flight instructor is do an ATC specific class. Uh, we do uh, a 12 hour class, which doesn't seem like much, but it's very impactful that focuses purely on uh, communications, right? The structure, phraseology, those kind of things. And in pre-pandemic times, that would include a tour of the tower and also having controllers from our own North Perry Tower or Opelaka Tower come into the classroom. There's a lot of nerves and, and lack of confidence when you're a young student pilot on the radio. So meeting a controller, realizing they're a regular person with a baseball hat and shorts on, and which for some, for some reason, all traffic controllers seem to be wearing a baseball hat and, and shorts. Uh, but anyway, they come in and it kind of neutralizes things. And we're like, okay, this is the voice I hear on the other side of the radio. It brings down the stress level and gives your students more confidence. I certainly hope that when we get past these pandemic times, those tower tours will reopen. Uh, Nick and Daron have been very generous about even tours of Miami International and the Tracon, which is a whole nother thing, especially if you're an instrument level student, highly, highly worth uh, the effort. Um, again, once that comes back around, but if I could leave you with just a few ideas, um, we're in South Florida, there is no, shortage of English tutors and English schools. It seems like every little shopping center in Hialeah has an English tutor in there, right? So if you're associated with a school, reach out and, and see. Most of them are very inexpensive and a great way to go about it. There's lots of great English schools in South Florida uh, and many, many more are happening online. In fact, somebody pointed out to me, I was at the Flight School Association Conference not that long ago, and there is an app called AR Sim. You probably can't. Yeah, can't see that, right? But Alpha Romeo S-I-M, A-R Sim. And what this does is it uses the microphone to record you uh, as you go through phraseology. Can't say it's perfect, but it's a nice little tool for students and for anyone really to use to practice their aviation English, aviation phraseology. Of course, live ATC is your friend, you know, have it on in the background all the time for our students. And I'll, I'll share a special trick that somebody gave me about two years ago. It was a Taiwanese woman who had, a, who had no accent. She spoke great English with no accent, and she'd only been in the country about two years. And I asked her what her secret was. Anybody want to take a guess what her secret was to, to getting rid of her accent? And most of Miami has an accent, so don't worry about that. Uh, karaoke. Her secret was doing karaoke to get rid of her accent, right? Because because most accents come from nerves and karaoke kind of forces you to, 
to, to mimic the accent of whatever songs they're singing, right? So it forced her to, to speak up and to speak out and to focus on the sounds. And here she was only two years after learning English, almost without an accent, you know? Uh, so little, little tip, little trick there, do a karaoke night at your flight club, at your, at your flight school. Um, I'm gonna launch a little poll, which the Zoom allows us to do. And it's just kind of curiosity. You wanna know where everyone's uh, aviation experience is. Uh, just if you're a student pilot, private, commercial, ATP, if you're a traffic controller or other, right? Just kind of curious where everyone is. Oh, and everyone's participating. Thank you. This is interesting. You can see it live. <laughs> so no surprises here. Um, unfortunately, it's our student pilots that benefit the most from these kind of webinars, and they're not really present. Great lots of private pilots, commercial pilots, and even some uh, ATPs. I should have put in there if we had any flight instructors, but uh, thank you for participating in the poll. I think it kind of guides what level of, uh, of audience we're speaking to. So I just wanted to share what we're doing at Wayman Aviation Academy uh, for our international students for whom English is a second language. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend, if you have students, colleagues that have come from other um, from another country is don't let them uh, isolate themselves with other people from Indonesia or China or Turkey or wherever it might be, because if they all live together, they're all going to be speaking Turkish at home, right? And they're going to be watching Turkish movies and reading Turkish newspapers. When you're able to mix cultures and have a um, Chinese student living with a Turkish student living with a Mexican student, they by default end up speaking the common language, which is English, right? And so that makes a big impact um, and, and, and kind of encouraging people to consume news, consume movies, consume all those things in English will all improve upon their English. Um, those, that's my experience and my knowledge uh, of helping people with their, their English struggles. I'd, I'd love to pass it on to our next guest. Okay, and our next guest, as I mentioned, will be Dairon Fernandez from Miami Tracon. Hi, Dairon. Welcome. Hi, good, good afternoon. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, you'll have to excuse me. I'm not wearing my hat, Fernando <laughs> or uh, Eddie. <laughs> um, let, let me see if I can uh, share my screen real quick. Okay, there we go, perfect. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> so um, my objective here today is to discuss uh, some uh, TCAS resolution advisories, traffic uh, collision avoidance system resolution advisories that we've had in the uh, in our South Florida airspace, and to sort of uh, discuss um, some areas that we could maybe, uh, as local pilots, increase our awareness for where other airplanes might be going or where co some common flight paths might be. You're going to see some replays uh, from our radar uh, showing. A VFR airplane that's flying about outside of control of their space. They're outside of the class Bravo, they're outside of the class Delta. And uh, they're just flying about and they come into conflict with an IFR airplane that's in a position where usual IFR airplanes might be. Now, these guys are not doing anything uh, illegal, they're not doing anything wrong, but it's a good uh, activity, I guess, is to look at where these common uh, conflict points are and how we can best avoid them as, as uh, VFR pilots or as you know local pilots. Um, the first one that we're gonna replay here, I lost my mouse, there we go. I think I found it. The first one we're gonna watch here is um, an aircraft that's gonna be flying out of the Opelika class Delta on his own and he conflicts with an arrival that's coming in. So. I drew here, this is SASBO, which is the final uh, approach fix for a Winana left ILS approach. And then here is O'Kane. And here is on the radar map, 
Sasbo. And then over here, which is not really depicted, but generally that's where that's where it would be would be okay. And so let's go back to play and we'll play the event. So there is the 1200 code. That's what an air traffic controllers see when you're squawking VFR and you're on your own flying without flight following or, or without an IFR flight plan. So here is the Challenger 312 Equa Alpha. He's approaching at 1,600. He's on the localizer. He's in a conflict with the VFR. As you can see here, can I, I, I couldn't stop it. Hang on. As you can see here, the Challenger has, has two targets to contend with. He's got the 1200, my goodness, excuse me. <clears throat> Let me not click anything. The Challenger has the first target, the 1200 footer, or the 1200 code for 1,400 foot target in yellow. And above him, he's got a 2000 foot target. That's also going northbound. At this point, the controller does issue traffic or 312 Alpha traffic at 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and about a mile and a half. It's a direction altitude indicates 1,400 feet before Tampa known. The challenge is he's looking for the traffic. And at a certain point, the traffic collision avoidance system gives him a resolution advisory, which tells him to climb. And so he begins to climb and flies over the first target. The second target turns eastbound, probably inbound for nine right at, at uh, Opalaka. Or maybe nine left, as you can see, he crosses, he crosses the final. There you go. And so these, uh, these aircraft are not necessarily doing anything wrong, per se, or illegal. They're flying out there. But uh, this would be somewhere where you can expect an IFR airplane to be flying in, especially on a straight-in uh, arrival to a Palaka. Let's do the next one. <clears throat> this one is uh, affecting Lauderdale International Airport. As you guys know, Lauderdale is a Class Charlie airport. And so here depicted, if I can find my mouse again. These mice are sneaky. The overlay is going to be, that would be Nove, 10, uh, six miles from the airport, which depicted here by this vertical line. That's a final approach fix for one zero left. Over here would be Pion, which is six miles away from that, depicted over here by this vertical uh, hash right there. And you'll see this VFR. I, I can't say, I forgot if this one departs North Perry or if it departs Opelika. But either way, outside of the Class Charlie, the Class Charlie ends right here, just inside of, um, of Pion. So he'll go this way, he'll begin to climb. We will issue traffic on JetBlue. You'll see the controller take JetBlue off this path and take him north around him. And he, JetBlue uh, makes a successful landing. But what you want to pay attention to is Spirit Wings here on the downwind. You'll see Spirit Wings fly the downwind and gets turned into the VFR at 4,000. Now, I want to explain why he gets turned in. There, you can barely see um, 1,700 foot. That is an IFR arrival. 2,800 foot is an IFR arrival, and there is another IFR arrival coming in on the straight end. And so the controller is expecting him to stay low level and using vertical separation, he turns JetBlue, or I'm sorry, Spear Wings in. And you'll see that once this guy starts climbing, the TCAS is hard to, uh, to be prevented. Give me one second. There we go. So JetBlue, I'm not sure if he gets TCAS right, he might have. Here comes Spirit Wings. And so at this point, the controller is expecting him to stay at three. I, I don't want to use the word expecting, but you know, we're, we, it's hard to predict what the VFR traffic will do, but we basically work around uh, what he's doing, his general direction. And so at 4,000 feet, he decides to turn spear, wherever she decides to turn spear wings in, you'll see that there is the client starts, the turn has already been committed. Here's the other IFR uh, airplane inbound. And so what the controller's done here, he's taken what we call a gap, IFR, IFR, we're gonna go in there for the arrival. And he's turned in, it's committed in the turn, he issues the traffic. At this point, the TCAS alert goes off. 
and Spear Wings gets a TKSRA. He's held at 4,000, recovering from the TKSRA. He ends up having to come back around, but he's, he's uh, too high on this table. And the next one is another Lauderdale final. This is, these is uh, Pion from the previous point. There's Pion here. This is a little further out. There's Pion there. Out here will be Holland. And Holland is, as you can see, very close to, actually probably over the, uh, the uh, training area out to the west, northwest of Opalaka and North Perry. And you'll see, I forget which one this one, Victor Bravo Echo, or I think there's a Delta behind him. Let's see what happens here. Here's a 3,900 foot aircraft flying westbound, climbing 4,000 feet. There he goes, turns back into the traffic. There's Delta. Issue traffic with uh, Bravo Echo. I don't think he gets a TCAS array, but as you can see, um, we, in, for some reason, I don't have a history of the VFR uh, target, but we have history trails as well. So we can sort of generally see where the VFR is going. And he was tracking to the Southwest. So the controller continues with Delta at 6,000 feet. He might not even have issued him an approach clearance already. Issues the traffic one more time. The traffic turns into Delta at 5,500 feet and climbing, triggers his TKSRA. And as the controller had turned to Delta, Delta responds to TKSRA as well. And the last one is offshore. Um, this one's a little interesting because of the way that South Florida is and Bimini. Uh, airplanes flying. So this is a magenta line. And I wanted to depict this because this decal intersection is, uh, is on our low charts. It is on many of our arrivals into Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this is a published fix, both on a VFR map and on actual uh, procedures inbound. From Fort Lauderdale to Bimini is that straight line. So VFR airplanes that depart from North Perry and they want to go to Bimini, or they depart Fort Lauderdale, want to go to Bimini, or even FXC sometimes end up very close in the vicinity of decal as they head over to Bimini. Sometimes they go past Bimini and they climb a little higher. But anyways, we wanted to show this because for some reason, this, this, this fix is a magnet. And we have uh, IFR traffic that crosses here between five and 6,000 feet, depending on what type of, uh, of direction Miami International Airport is landing. And talking to no one, there's decal here. And it's, uh, it's an interesting fix as well, because you see this line here, this is a boundary line between Miami Center which will be talking to these gentlemen here or ladies. And now on this side is Miami approach. And so we will take a handoff from Miami center. There'll be a VFR headed this way. And the controller that's working these airplanes here to the Southeast Miami center guy switches them. The controller working them on the Miami approach side has to also work the rest of his airplanes here. So he might see a VFR at 5,500. Here's Jeff Blue descending from 9,000 feet. And if you're not careful and, and really paying attention to a possible VFR or conflict, it's easy to miss. And as soon as this guy checks in, the first thing he's telling you is we have traffic at 12 o'clock and we're responding. So let's look at this replay. Here's the 1200 foot VFR target climbing to the west, I'm sorry, to the east. Fort Quebec Sierra is ascending. And so let's pause right here. At this point, for uh, Miami approach to turn that airplane, we have to call Miami Center and ask for control to turn them. And so we've got to get on the landline and they have to pick up. And I've got to say, hey, I want to control for, I want to turn them for Quebec Sierra for traffic. And they have to say approved. So it's a process that now I am being distracted from working one, two, three, four, maybe five or six more on this side airplanes to come back just for the VFR. So as you can, as you'll see here, the gentleman descends, has a TCAS RA. We've, we've turned him, but the TCAS RA already uh, took place. So uh, we'll, we'll, ask, we'll answer more questions at the end of this. But again, the, the, the point of this whole thing is to just discuss areas where we have uh, trends of traffic and collision alert system TCAS RAs and uh, how we can best in, you know, increase our awareness as local pilots using all available tools, ADSB in uh, to see where the traffic is, uh, use flight following, re uh, definitely recommend that. Um, we'd love to give you a service. I know sometimes you're very, very busy 
and it's a little daunting to get on the frequency. Uh, I know one of our uh, our attendees commented that we speak very fast. Listen, I, I'm with you. I am 100% with you. When I started this business 14 years ago, um, <clears throat> I spoke very fast. I still do speak very fast. <clears throat> and I uh, control uh, one of the best controls that I've ever worked with uh, would speak very slow and deliberate. Mm -hmm. And when I would work with him, I would move less airplanes than he would talking twice as fast. And so, you know, when we get nervous, when we get uh, busy, it's very easy for us to increase our rate of, of speech. So anyway, it's not an excuse, but uh, do give us a call for flight following. We'd love to give you a service um, and use all your available tools to see, take what we've just shown you here, look left and right, you know, use your altitude accordingly. Something that I haven't brought up that, that we saw recently, and I'll bring it up uh, if I think I have it here. Uh, that's not a good map. Um, when you transition west of the class Bravo or underneath the class Bravo, <clears throat> um, as you can see here, these are successful examples of the TCAS uh, working. Uh, collision was averted. Everyone went home safely. Um, but this is a distraction for both the flight crew uh, for ATC, not to mention the passengers in the back that you know are, are getting a nice little uh, maneuver but definitely a distraction for us. And so when you transition the class Bravo, again, I don't have a good map here, but when you're un under the Bravo, let's say you know the base here is 3000 feet. If you are over here at 2,900 feet, that's a distraction and you are legal, but everybody that comes in that I've descended to 3000 feet to clear them for the approach, now I have to call traffic and it might still set off the TCAS RA. So now I've got to stop everybody at 4,000 feet. And so it's a distraction for us. It's a possible TCAS array for the other aircraft. And it's not necessarily a, a safe thing for you too. A lot of heavy arrivals into Miami, 747s, 787s, 777s. Uh, the A380 isn't coming anymore. But anyways, uh, that wake turbulence is still there and it can definitely be a, a safety uh, risk for you. Uh, and so not necessarily a good idea. Give yourself an extra buffer when you're under the class Bravo, 500 feet, 1,000 feet. That's always a good idea. Helps us helps uh, the uh, jets or other uh, uh, heavy traffic into Miami. And it definitely adds a safety buffer for you. And so that's all I have. Nick, you got your hat? <laughs> okay. uh, no, I, can't, I can't find it. <laughs> so Dylan, that's all what you have. I can tell you if you judge by my accent, I need you to speak slow to me. And if you judge by my plane, a small plane, really, I'm not competing with any 777 or something. <laughs> I won't be able to do it. So I'm well, with you. I'm with you. Thank you so much for all your beneficial words. And we appreciate it. That was Dyron Fernandez from Miami Tracon. Be prepared. You're getting out of the United States to the Eddies, you're coming back, you speak with Dion. <laughs> so, hey, sharp your English, no? <laughs> All right, Dion, thank you so much. And now we will go to Nicolas Candelier, also from Miami Tracon. And Nicolas will speak about all the flying in all the classes, include the Red Road transition. Nick, it's yours. Okay. Good evening, everybody. So uh, my name is Nicholas Candelier. I'm also a controller with, uh, with Dayron at Miami Approach Control. So work with them often, very often. So tonight, uh, my portion of the presentation, I'll be talking about the uh, VFR transitions over Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Also a little bit about VFR flying in the area as well, kind of touch up on a couple of points that Dayron had brought up. So. Um, let's see if we can get this going. There we go. Uh, we'll touch on, do like a little overview of the current airspace that we have here uh, in Miami, discuss the keyhole, which uh, Daron had a couple of radar replays from that. Um, also the class Bravo class Charlie redesign, a little update with that as well. When we start talking about the transitions, uh, we'll go and define a couple of items, uh, talk about the transition that was published uh, earlier in the year what to do, how to fly it, how to talk to ATC, uh, and what you're gonna need in order to successfully uh, fly that transition. 
And then at the end, we'll, uh, we'll save time for questions towards the end, end of the evening. So, uh, so to start uh, the current airspace, the class problem, class Charlie, it's, it's old airspace. Uh, it was designed in the 1980s. Uh, back then, it, it worked for what they had um, and worked with the traffic. However, since Miami has exploded with, uh, with aviation, all these airlines adding flights and general aviation flying in and out, um, the current airspace cannot handle uh, what we have today. Uh, and it's a, it's a busy chunk of airspace as well. Um, so within, within just a small 45 mile radius, uh, we have two core 30 airports, Miami International with the class Bravo and Fort Lauderdale International with the class Charlie. Um, a core 30 airport are the uh, top 30 airports within the nation. So we have two already down here within 20, or, you know, 20 miles of each other. So uh, we also have seven airports with class Delta airspace, some of which are the uh, busiest contract towers in the nation uh, here in South Florida. Uh, we also have three alert areas, military operations, skydive operations, gliders, uh, you name it, we, we have it down here. So, um, so it's, it's busy. Uh, like I said, a lot of stuff going on within 45 miles of Miami International. Um, and again, the, the current class Bravo class Charlie is, uh, is strained and can't really, can't really handle it. Um, this is another little depiction. So this is our radar map. As Darren had mentioned before, these solid lines on the outside depicts our airspace boundary between Miami Approach Control and Miami Center. And within Miami Approach, we control all the way from Boca all the way down to Ocean Reef Airport, all the arrivals, departures in between, and all the VFR flight following. So, um, so about 40 miles around Miami, surface to 16,000 feet. Uh, and to kind of touch on something that Darren had brought up earlier with, uh, with the VFR aircraft climbing in and out of uh, Opelika and North Perry or descending in, uh, I've always heard it as the keyhole. It's one of the first uh, terms that I heard when I started doing the presentations with, uh, with Ziva a couple of years ago, a few years ago, uh, back in North Perry. Uh, but the keyhole, in my opinion, is probably one of the most dangerous spots in our airspace. Uh, it's deceiving and in my opinion leads pilots into thinking that they can do something and they're good and in the clear and then really in actuality they are. Um, so as Darren had kind of pointed out before on the radar map, it's the area between the class Bravo and the class Charlie that doesn't really have any restrictions that hold pilots back from climbing into or descending into uh, aircraft that are trying to land into Fort Lauderdale. Um, so again, very deceiving, kind of leads pilots into thinking that they're good when they're not, because uh, it's, it's busy. You have the finals for 10 left, 10 right into Fort Lauderdale. You also have the downwind for those runways uh, descending in. And then just above that, you also have the final approach course for executive runway nine. Uh, so just in that few short miles, there's a lot going on and a lot of airplanes fly, uh, flying. It's very congested. So a lot of people competing for this, for this airspace here. Um, so we do run into issues like Darren had pointed out, there was a three week period back in June of 2019, uh, where we had 42 events, uh, that were recorded with VFR aircraft, not receiving ATC services, uh, that either climbed into close proximity or descended into close proximity with, uh, aircraft arriving into Fort Lauderdale. Um, and like Darren had pointed out, it's, it's a busy time when a VFR aircraft gets involved in that kind of uh, mix of traffic. Uh, when they're not talking to ATC or getting advisories, um, creates a lot of work for workload for the pilots because they have to respond to those TCAS RAs. They can't just ignore them. And then we also have to do what's a recovery or a sector recovery. So we have to recover the situation, not only with that airplane, but with all the other airplanes in the sector, resequence, uh, you know, re-clear, go arounds, everything like that. We have to deal with it. So, um, so uh, there was one time, let's see, probably last year, I think, just towards uh, towards the end when everything started to open back up, I had I was busy with about eight arrivals all in a line, and then three VFRs came off of North Perry, climbed right into the finals, hung out and did some spins, and all eight of them were going all over the place. So it's uh, it can get, I'll call it messy, but um, something to be aware about. And I think I saw a question earlier too about how do you avoid the areas. Best way 
If you're unsure of, you know, how the operation goes or anything like that, get flight following. That's what we're here for. We're here to provide a service. We're here for your safety. Um, get flight following. And then once you're like, eh, I don't need it anymore, you can cancel. So, um, so to kind of answer that question. But again, uh, something to be aware of. And then this kind of here, I'd like to bring this up because it kind of gives a depiction of how we run our traffic. So this shows the arrival tracks on an east operation uh, from Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Also depicts the keyhole area there. So again, you can see it's a busy spot. We're turning from the down to the base and from the base, clearing the aircraft for the approach and joining the finals. We also have all the straight in approaches coming in that we have to clear for the approach uh, going to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, again, a busy spot. Uh, so one question that I always you know, get asked when I kind of start going over this is, you know, how are we fixing it? What are we doing? And that's where the class problem, class Charlie redesign comes in. So, uh, but I'll update you on that in just a second. So th again, this is the East operation and here it is on a West operation. And that class Bravo class Charlie redesign is highlighted in yellow. So that the yellow lines that you see all over, uh, that's the proposed design for the, uh, for the new class Bravo over Miami and class Charlie over Fort Lauderdale. Uh, one of our primary tasks when we were redesigning this was to close that gap was to create a safe buffer for VFR aircraft who are flying into or out of the area uh, and protect them from the arrivals and departures coming out of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, so that was one of our primary tasks when we were doing this. And that's, uh, as you can see where the red arrow is, we, we did make a shelf so that way VFR aircraft can transition underneath, um, but also provides that buffer for the arrivals going in, uh, especially on, a, on an east operation. So just kind of a, a status update on that, because I know a lot of people have asked and have been involved as well. Um, it's going through the final stages, uh, getting final approval, and a couple more steps along the way, but the anticipated publication date for, if this gets all approved, uh, we're aiming for the end of January, that, uh, that publication cycle. So, um, so we'll see what happens over the next month or two and see if it gets the final approval, so. A little update on that. Um, but when I joined the redesign team back in 2016 uh, for the Bravo and the Charlie, uh, one of the things that myself and a coworker had first started doing was uh, looking over all the public comments from previous, uh, previous designs and all the work some other people had done before us. So, uh, so back in 2016, as we were going through these comments, we noticed that a lot of people um, had suggested either a VFR corridor or a VFR transition. And so one of the first things we did, once we kind of tallied everything up was we had to define them. So, uh, so what's the difference? A VFR corridor is basically a tunnel. It's a tunnel through the class Bravo airspace. VFR aircraft can transition in, you know, through this area and everything without talking to ATC. They don't need a clearance. They don't need a tune a radio or anything like that. They just plow on through this little tunnel uh, that's drilled through the class Bravo. Um, so that's a corridor. And then we also have a transition. Uh, so a VFR transition is a little different. Here comes my cat. Uh, <laughs> it's defined as a specific flight course uh, on a chart for a VFR aircraft to transition uh, through a class problem. Sorry. Um, there we go. Uh, so it allows aircraft to transition, but they still they require an ATC clearance. And they also require specific altitudes. Um, so, and after a clearance is received, pilots must fly the route as depicted, and most importantly, adhere to ATC instructions. So now that we have both defined, we were able to kind of compare the two and see what we wanted to do. So with the VFR corridor, such as the one here that's in San Diego, um, one of the things that we really had to consider was during our six to eight months out of the year, when we have weather and thunderstorms and all that other fun stuff, uh, would this fit our airspace? And the answer was no, because if VFR aircraft are allowed to transition through here without talking to ATC, we don't have any control over that. And VFR aircraft, we know are unpredictable and sometimes, you know, kind of do some occasionally wacky things. Uh, but because of that, it introduced a very big safety risk into the system and into the area. And we couldn't have a VFR quarter. Uh, and then once we looked at the VFR transitions, we were kind of like, okay, we have a little bit more control over this. We can um, allow VFR aircraft to still transition the area, still be able to do what they want. But again, it requires an ATC clearance. So 
That's why the corridor, uh, corridor didn't happen. So we went with the transition, such as the one here depicted over Seattle. The other thing that we kind of did was we copied Seattle a little bit as well, because we really liked how they had everything depicted on the chart. Uh, they have all the instructions, the altitudes and everything. Um, and that was one of the, uh, one of the things that we kind of took away from that. Um, so one of the first things you'll find on the charts are is just this standard little blurb about VFR transitions. But the biggest thing to remember is that ATC clearances are required for this. You have to either talk to ATC, and especially when it goes through the Bravo, you need your class Bravo clearance. So remember that. Again, we wanted to keep it pilot friendly. So user friendly, make sure everybody's on the same page from the start. So you'll find on the chart uh, that the frequencies are published. So at the north, you have 19.7 that's published near Pompano. And in the south near Homestead and Tamiami, you have 25.5. So right from the start, everybody's on the same page, should be in the right spot. And then stealing from Seattle and what they did, we published altitudes in the routes. So over Fort Lauderdale, uh, it's actually published as the Fort Lauderdale overhead transition. Uh, so uh, 2,500 or as assigned by ATC and there's a northbound and southbound route. So that way if two aircraft are transitioning at the same time, we can at least have some separation between the two. And the other thing that we did as well was we published the shoreline transition. So that way you don't have to call approach to ask for the class Charlie or to get the code or everything like that. You can tune right to Fort Lauderdale Towers frequency and get your, uh, get everything that you need in order to do the shoreline transition through their portion of the airspace. And then moving south with the famous Red Road transition. Uh, so this one here is published at 3,500 or as assigned by ATC, also includes a northbound southbound route so that way two aircraft can transition at the same time, opposite direction, uh, gives the controller some ease of mind and also gives the pilots, uh, pilots some ease of mind too. Uh, one of the things to kind of note too is the altitudes. Uh, Cause one of the comments that I always get when I kind of talk about this is the 3,500 foot altitude. And I know down here in South Florida, the clouds are never cooperative. They love to hang out at like 2,800 or 3,200 and they never really allow a pilot to climb up to 35. We know it's difficult. Um, but uh, when it came time to publish, uh, we figure we at least publish with a safety buffer because our go arounds at Miami climbed to 3000 and then off of Fort Lauderdale, they climbed to 2000. Um, so you have that buffer. And the story that I always like to give with this as well is uh, one night when I was working, I gave a, a Skyhawk the Red Road transition at 3500. And as he was passing right over the airport, a British Airways A380 went around and passed directly underneath the Skyhawk. And he loved it. Uh, he thought it was the greatest thing in the world and thought I planned that for him. And unfortunately I did not, but, um, but it was evidence to me that publishing it needed to be 3,500. Um, like I said, I know the clouds aren't cooperative. Uh, I know they don't sometimes allow it. So that's why we also put, or as assigned by ATC, uh, because sometimes depending on volume or, you know, or what's going on at the time, we can work out different altitudes. Um, we can work out something lower. We just have to coordinate with the tower, let them know, Hey, this guy's a little bit lower than usual. So be careful with go arounds, um, and kind of, and kind of work something out, work out a little deal as they transition over the airport. So, uh, so this is the red road transition. And this is what it looks like when it's charted. So uh, over the shoreline, you have the shoreline transition. Uh, that's the one that you'd be talking to Fort Lauderdale Tower with, and they'll instruct you either to stay at or below 500 or uh, to remain clear of the Charlie, because sometimes on a west operation, uh, they will have you stay outside the surface area. So that way you don't interfere with arrivals, give them TCAS resolution advisors or anything like that. So it uh, helps out their operation. The one over the airport is the, uh, the overhead transition. That's where you'd be talking to either Darren or myself or any of our coworkers in the Tracon. Uh, and you can see the north and southbound transitions. And then it kind of converges over the antenna farm and goes south towards Opalaka. Uh, one thing to note is that once you're in that antenna farm, you know, the Hard Rock Stadium area, and you're going southbound, don't forget you're going to need your class Bravo clearance. Uh, super important to remember. Uh, you need your class Bravo clearance. I can't stress that enough. Um, so if you don't get it by the Hard Rock Stadium, uh, that's a good point to say, eh, we're gonna call it quits. Uh, you need to go out to the west or out over the shoreline to transition around the class Bravo, okay? Um, but just remember, have an out 
in case you don't get it. Sometimes it's a very busy spot. So sometimes the controller might not have time or might forget. So just, just be ready for that. And then down, moving a little bit to the south, uh, here is what it looks like over Miami National. So you have your north and southbound routes. And then it kind of goes down and converges over the Dayland Shopping Center. And then you can either descend out of the Plas Bravo or just continue over Homestead and go down to the Keys or wherever you might be going to the south. Um, when you're traveling northbound, uh, remember that you need your Class Bravo clearance. So in order to start this entire thing from the south, you first need that Class Bravo clearance, have an out, and just remember that you have to kind of also plan your out around the Tamiami Class Delta and the Homestead Class Delta airspace. So keep that in mind as well. Um, one thing that I kind of want to touch on, just as a little side topic, is what Darren was talking about earlier with the transitioning underneath. So here are, uh, you have your finals from Miami National. If you go directly west, kind of near the North Cement plant and just outside of that, in that 3,000 foot shelf area, some planes love to hang out there at 29, 2,800 feet. And like Darren, I mentioned, it does, uh, does have an impact to the operation. Even though you're legal, it, it does have a significant impact to the operation. So just something to keep in mind. To kind of put it together, so on the right, that's the full depiction of the uh, transition. Uh, so um, this is some of my personal pointers uh, that I kind of came up with. Study before you fly it. Um, go to skyvector.com or ForeFlight or whatever, zoom in, zoom out, take a look at you know, everything that you might need uh, to do or the pass that you might need to take when you fly the transition. Look at the far aim. It has some good resources and definitions. That's where I had the uh, I pulled the two definitions before. So take a look at that. Uh, and when you're in the air, if you have any questions or any doubts, and you're kind of, eh, I don't really know, uh, ask. That's what we're here for. Uh, even though you know we might have some things going on, um, definitely ask. You know, and uh, as far as you know, like, okay, you know, when should I turn? Am I clear of traffic and and everything like that? So, um, so definitely don't. Don't be hesitant to ask and keep yourself out of trouble. So uh, one thing I also get told sometimes, actually a lot of times by uh, older pilots is the red road transition, they ask for it, but they never get it. Uh, I understand. So um, it is, the class Bravo clearance is given workload permitting. So we, I, I know that sometimes it's frustrating because you really wanna do it and then you get denied. Uh, sometimes it's based on controller crankiness as well. I know some controllers are just are just cranky. I can't help that, so I'm sorry. Um, but it is workload permitting, um, so uh, that's why you don't get it. Sometimes we have you know early in the morning or around eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, we have a lot of arrivals coming in. And right after that, we have a lot of departures. So between eight and noon, it's nonstop. Uh, so that's definitely a bad time to ask. Um, and then. I would say 6.30 to 8.30 at night, not a good time to ask because we have all of our cargo guys coming in, all of, a lot of arrivals coming in. And then, uh, and then shortly after that arrival bank, we have a late night departure bank that starts around 10. So, um, so there are times, you know, you might get it, uh, 2 a.m. I always give it a 2 a.m. So, <laughs> um, but biggest thing to remember out of all this, talk to ATC, get your class Bravo clearance, and follow the red arrows. You know, the red arrows, if you follow them, will keep you out of trouble. So uh, if you get the entire transition. And once you're cleared into the Bravo, and once you're following the red arrows, just be ready for air traffic instructions. Uh, so those are my, my little tips on how to successfully do this. So uh, that concludes everything that I have to say about the, the transitions and some VFR flying. Um, I believe we're going to do questions at the end. Uh, so by all means, I look forward to those and thank you for listening. Well, it'd be good to do uh, questions after each speaker. And I think okay. there's some here specifically for you. Sure. Rafael wants to know, uh, will flight following provide you with a class B clearance if you advise you want the red road transition? Uh, no, so you need, you specifically need to hear the, the magic words, cleared into Miami class Bravo airspace. Okay. So you, you, you might be able to get flight following, mm -hmm. you can skirt, you can get close to it but don't touch it until you hear the magic words cleared into Miami class Bravo airspace. So. And Rafael, I don't think I understand this question exactly. Uh, how do you use PF VFR flyways? I'm not sure we can get a translation on that. 
uh, let me see. Could you... Well, I can actually turn on Raphael's uh, oh, okay. audio if you want to just ask a question, yeah. Raphael. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. That was just a typo. It's just um, when you had mentioned it, uh, the traffic going westbound out of North Perry and turning north, uh, I noticed that there are VFR fly, uh, flyways going over 27. As long as you stay under 3,000, would you I would imagine that that's the best way to cut and basically in front of in incoming tra uh, traffic to Fort Lauderdale, right? Yeah, so I believe you're talking about this spot here. There's you can use this flyway here. That's fine. Um, you can also go just to the oh. shoreline like, like everybody does. So um, this flyway here was kind of designed to help pilots get out of the North Perry Opelaka area rather than going up through this, yeah. uh, through this corridor. So, um, but you have, you have either option on this. Thing. So the shoreline might be the more scenic group out West might be, yeah, kind of, you just have the Everglades, so. <laughs> But um, so yeah, it's, it's totally up to you. I never noticed those flyways. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of hidden, they blend in. <laughs> Great, there was also some questions uh, in the chat. One of them that I've always thought about, wouldn't reopening Opalaka West help relieve GA congestion, Opalaka and North Perry? Any thoughts on Opalaka West? That's a good question. It would seem fun, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't honestly have an opinion. I mean, it could help out with like some some practice approaches and some fun stuff like that. I don't know, Darren. What do you think? That would be a question best posed for Miami Day. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're the so, ones that uh, that close yeah. it down. I, I. I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not really sure. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I, I actually had, I was I, a couple of years ago, I sat in something that had uh, the Miami-Dade director in there. And I believe his, the quote was, an act of God closed Opalaka West and it would take an act of God to reopen Opalaka West. <laughs> that being said, it makes a lot of sense. It's right there on the edge and, you know, North Perry and Opalaka are now surrounded by residential areas. Yeah. Uh, so ask your local congressman. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess um, the, the runways are still there, right? Yes, yeah, they are. So. Uh, a lot of trees, and there's a big cement pole. I believe uh, maybe well, actually one of our attendees had a, a, a emergency landing there a few years ago, but he made it in and out. Something that I wanted to discuss about uh, Rafael's question about the uh, views for VFR flyways is uh, just because you're on a VFR flyway uh, doesn't necessarily, uh, oh, yeah. you know. Uh, prevent TCAS RAs or prevent conflicts with IFR or VFR airplanes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, what we do in our business, we, it's heavy on IFR traffic and flight following and practice approaches. That's what Nick and I do day in and day out. And so when, when, a, when a, a VFR pilot checks on and says, hey, we're, we're on the flyway, or we're, we're doing the flyway, it could be a little confusing for the controller especially since not, not all of us, uh, actually the majority of us don't really have any flying experience, much less, uh, you know, uh, VFR flying or prior pilot, that kind of stuff. So we, we might not necessarily understand what you're saying by we're following the VFR flyway. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, our line manager from FISDA 19, Tony Saavedra, with us, he might want to say something about alternatives of airport. See if you can get him on. Oh, uh, let's see if we can do that. Um, hate to put him on the spot, but we get to put him on the spot. Hey, Tony, uh, anything to say about the recent presentation? Hey, Eddie, what's going on? Like your opinion, I guess, on the the the, the changes in the airspace and uh, Opalaka West. Uh, the airspace uh, changes, they're definitely a necessity. I mean, it's it's uh, been way too long and the air is just too congested with uh, North Perry being the number one busiest contract tower throughout the nation for GA traffic. And, you know, we're, we're jammed up with Opalaka and six miles away, you got Miami, you know, to the north, you got Executive, you got Pompano, you got Boca, there's just so much GA traffic in the area, you need, you know, to enhance these airspaces, because not only 
is the GA traffic increasing, you know, so is the, the cargo traffic, the 135 operators, the 121 carriers are even growing uh, down here as well. And we even have 129 operators, which are, you know, flying the large aircraft and through a contract basis as well. So <clears throat> we need that. Now, as far as Opalaka West, that would be a nightmare. It really would. Uh, I worked at, as a controller, I worked at North Perry, I worked at Opalaka, I worked at Boca. And, you know, with what we have already in the system, opening Opalaka West, would it's just way too congested to have a North Perry and Opalaka West and an Opalaka right there. I mean, you're just talking a recipe for disaster. Now, if there was a, a fast train to TNT <laughs> to get people out there, that would be the perfect spot to put all the GA aircraft. Uh, it's just driving wise, it stinks to get out there. Uh, but you'd have you know, uninhibited traffic out there. You know, if they were able to expand that, maybe put a parallel runway out there, you can make that, you know, a fantastic spot for all GA traffic. It's far enough, further enough away from Miami that uh, it really wouldn't interfere with any of their traffic. It's definitely far away from all the congested uh, areas, the uh, housing areas, developments in Opalaka and, and North Perry, that even bring all that traffic out there and really release a lot of congestion from the... Uh, Miami approach controllers, you know, even day run. <clears throat> so, uh, <laughs> um, but no, I, I mean, I, that's what I would think as far as that goes. Uh, we have a lot of things going on. You know, we're, we're at a lot of airports, as a lot of you know, we're doing a lot of, you know, background stuff and uh, a lot of inspections that are going on lately. You know, we're trying to keep things safe. North Perry has unfortunately had a, a stigma for being a very unsafe airport, um, but it's really, if you really look at the numbers, it's not an unsafe airport. It's just that there's a lot more traffic. When you're when you're looking at sheer numbers, you know some folks might say, "Well, you know, Pompano's not that bad." Well, Pompano doesn't have even a quarter of the numbers that Hollywood North Perry has. Nor does it even have a quarter of the flight schools that North Perry has. So when you have a, a lot a huge amount of numbers like this, you're going to have more problems. So, but then when you look at that as a whole, North Perry nationwide is not on the top of the list either. So it's actually right there about average for uh, incidents and accidents. So, which is great. Of course, we want to get that number down as low as we can. And we do that by the fast team outreach, by, you know, us being out there looking at folks and, and talking to folks. And, you know, it's also trying to get down with the instructors as well so that we can actually impose on them a lot of the safety concerns that we have and it does, and that's one of the biggest things that we're really doing as an initiative to really get with the instructors and we're looking at everything that they're doing as well, because, you know, as you know, if you, if you have a, a bad student, you know, later he's going to become a bad instructor and then he's going to pr produce bad students himself. And, and that's what we don't want. We want the best quality of folks out there, you know, not for us, for them, you know, for the safety of everyone. And that's what we're really, you know, striving to do right now. And I guess if United gets its way with a supersonic aircraft, we might have our supersonic port back out at TNT, right? No, that, would, that would be nice too, yeah. I'll take that flight. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Tony. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tony. Take care. And I would like to invite our um, last speaker, and then we will take all those questions which we see they're coming up. Our last speaker will be Cedric McQueen. He's the manager of North Perry Airport for many years. A lot of experience in other airports also, and he will tell us about trafficking out in the area. So, Cedric, are you here? Yes, I'm here, Ziva. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, as Ziva said, my name is Cedric McQueen. I'm the air traffic manager at North Perry Airport. Um, been there as the manager for three, going on three years, and a controller for uh, eleven. So. I've seen almost everything at Perry that's at Perry now. When I first started, traffic was um, a lot slower. And over the last years, traffic has increased uh, dramatically. Uh, we have 12 flight schools now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, runway construction going on now. Um, that's an, uh, not, big, not that big of an issue. Um, over the last couple of weeks, um, at a meeting with the uh, tenants and uh, some came up about uh, intersection departures versus the full length departure. So the control started issuing full length and 
like point incursions increase. So here back rebacks are important. Um, it's the rainy season. So as VFR traffic, um, we give you the weather, not to deter you from flying, but to think about putting yourself in a position that could be adverse. Um, you know, you get out four miles and be like, I need to get back to the airport. You know, so we just try to keep, you know, make you aware of the situation, keep you advised of the weather. Um, it's not to deter anyone from flying. We want everybody to fly. Um, flying is fun. Flying is life for a lot of people. Um, to piggyback off Darren and um, the keyhole, even in the tower, people check in northwest bound and immediately as a patroller, you're like, wow, why are you at this altitude passing under Lauderdale's class, you know, under the finals at Lauderdale? Uh, just be aware, just because it's not illegal, does it make it smart, you know, good practices, um, checklists. Uh, we see a lot of people don't do checklists. Uh, just because you've been flying that airplane for 15 years, uh, those checklists are important. Uh, it'll keep a lot of incidents and accidents from happening. Uh, just be smart. Um, you know, plan out your flight. If you, you know, I don't know if people check for divert airports anymore. I was in the military. And that was mandatory for military flights. They had to uh, put divert airports in case of bad weather. You know, we're in South Florida, thunderstorms pop up all the time. So just be aware of the uh, the weather and, uh, you know, I ain't gonna say do your research, but make sure you have divert airports if you need them. Um, it's just something to have in a bag, you know, another two, another out. Um, as my old manager would say, kiss, keep it simple. You know, I ain't gonna say the last word, but, <laughs> but he was the area manager, but you know, he keep it simple, you know, just be, I guess, just think, um, Wayman's going to have construction starting soon. Shouldn't affect anybody except for Wayman. Uh, the construction for 10 right should be done soon, hopefully. Um, as everybody know, we've been waiting on environmental. Uh, it was a situation with um, uh, livestock. So that's been the hold up for the construction. I don't have any uh, presentation, I'm sorry. I'm currently in South Carolina, I had a, a family emergency. So I had to uh, evacuate, no, well, not evacuate, but I had to get to South Carolina quick. Um, everybody's been doing a good job at Perry so far. Um, as Tony said, we are the busiest, well, either number one or number two busiest contract airport in the nation. And we are about average for incidents and accidents. Uh, we want to get that below average. Uh, that's why we have a, a runway safety meeting Monday, our RSAT meeting uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, my email is on here. If anybody wants to join, I can see the link for that for two, uh, Monday at 2. Um, I think Tony will be there. I think Ziva will be there as well. But we do this every year, the, the runway safety meeting, to keep everyone um, abreast of uh, incidents and accidents that happen throughout the year, throughout the fiscal year. And like I said, we always try to minimize everything, you know. So everybody's doing a good job at Perry. Thank you. I think you're muted, Ziva. Try uh, unmuting. Thank you, Cedric. How, how are we doing with those releases? We're doing good? Yeah, every, everything's good. Everything's good. I appreciate it. And, you know, the Sheridan departure, um, the Sheridan departure was created to keep traffic out of Lauderdale's class, Charlie, IFR. So um, when I get back, I got to deal with the possible pilot deviation for traffic department, Perry, that had an RA with the Spirit flight on final for a 10 right. So um, just, you know, be aware, you know, um, try to keep the downwinds in as close as possible. I mean, 
it's no, no, I don't think it's any need to go three miles, you know, on a crosswind unless you're experiencing an emergency or a possible emergency. And, you know, and if that's the case, let us know so we can coordinate with Lauderdale, Miami. Hey, got this guy, he's, you know, traffic, you know, having an emergency experience or something like that. And that way they can be on top of their game to know that, okay, that traffic might conflict with my traffic. You know, everything is, we can work around everything with coordination most of the time. So. There's a question from Andrew. If Cedric could elaborate on the types of contract traffic at Perry, but I think that's a misunderstanding about it. The contract tower, the same contract traffic. Oh, uh, so contract tower program started in the late eighties, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's, I think 400 and something total contract towers. Um, Perry, Opalaca, Boca, Pompano, Key West, Fort Myers, no, not Fort Myers, um, Stewart, um, Naples. These are all contract towers. And it's a lot more, I think Florida has the most contract towers uh, in the nation. St. Augustine's contract tower, Craig and Jacksonville's contract. Um, and that is, we, we do the same thing. Um, we have to have the same experience as FA controllers, um, but we don't hire controllers for the academy. Um, when you come to towers like Perry, Opalaka, you have air traffic control experience either from military or uh, retired FA. I also understand that uh, North Perry is gonna be getting a new tower. When do you expect that to happen? That is the plan. Um, Nina is working hard for a new tower. Um, we've met with the uh, contractor and um, have proposed sites. Um, I'm just waiting on the next step and funding, I guess. But yeah, so hopefully in the next four or five years, be a new, taller, better tower to alleviate blind spots and stuff that we have from the tower, from like the Pelican, other side of Pelican ramp and uh, the north side of uh, Bravo. So as a, as a regular pilot and uh, of course a flight school, what can we do to make your lives easier? Traffic controllers, TRACON, my international. Uh, well, you said it earlier. I mean, English is a, a big factor for a lot of students. And as, as a controller in the tower, um, when we have, you know, some days we have eight, nine, 10 planes in the pattern. And to say one transmission five times kind of puts us behind our workload. And um, so if you're an uh, instructor and um, if you can take over a little sooner, like we want everybody to learn understand everybody has to learn and um but sometimes if we're like super busy um it kind of puts us behind the power curve i tell all the controllers upstairs you know we're, we're customer service representatives pretty much you know we're providing the service so be cognizant you know don't jump down a pilot's throat because they said something wrong or you know sometimes but and if that happens let me know and i will <laughs> Yeah, to echo what uh, Cedric uh, said, um, we, we definitely want uh, to give you a service. We definitely want to um, help you with the communication because it's important as a, as a, as a student pilot to get uh, you know, uh, confidence talking with air traffic control and practice is really where it's at, right? You get the confidence, you know what you gotta say, what they're gonna tell you, you what to expect. But if it's very busy and you're, and you're an instructor, you know, the when it's busy and you're flying the airplane uh, doing practice approaches, that's not necessarily the best time to teach your students ATC communication. It's a good time to teach your student how to fly an approach, but not necessarily a good time to let him flounder uh, with readbacks when you can tell the controller is, is a little short on patience and he's got five other airplanes. Um, and then another thing that I want to harp on <clears throat> is um, unusual uh scenarios or uh, emergencies things like that 
when you have an emergency as a as a, a, a pilot you know most of the airline guys they they do every six months they do unusual um you know, emergencies engine failures whatever ga pods not so much so when you have an emergency um be clear and concise you don't have to use the fancy atc roger roger over just tell us what you need hey i've got this and i want to do that you know and and we will move everything to get out of the way don't be scared of tony i've met tony from fisdo he's a fantastic guy fantastic guy um, you fly your airplane you get don't don't, don't lie to him yeah don't lie to him don't lie to tony uh, but you declare the emergency and tell us exactly what you need to get yourself on the ground uh, expeditiously in a safe manner you know the, tell the controller to shut up hey i have an emergency i have an engine failure be quiet i need to go here and we'll do it you know once you say emergency we stop and we will open up positions we will move ifr airplanes away from you we will take everybody off the frequency we will give you the handling but what i have seen uh is there are times when uh, you know we're hell a little hesitant to say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm in IMC conditions and, 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 and I, need, I need some help. We're a little hesitant to say, hey, I'm, I'm kind of low on gas and I know you're vectoring me to get all these airplanes and taking me a little further than, I'm, than I want to be, but I need to get back to the airport. So just communicate with us, tell us what you need at an early time so that we can make an impact in a successful uh, landing. Another thing like, like communication, if you don't understand uh, control instruction, say, can you say that in plain language? And, you know, we can, we can just spell it out for you. Um, don't assume anything. Don't be like, oh, I thought you wanted me to go here because, like you said, we're talking to several different airplanes at a time and we're expecting you to be here because that's where, you know, you were instructed to go. And then we look up and you're not there. And so we're like, oh, what happened to my airplane? Are they missing? You know, so um, if you don't understand something, just just let us know. And, to and Tony from FISDO, he is a controller, um, great guy. I've worked with him for uh, three years at Perry. And then he went to Opelok and Boca. And I still work with him now at FISDO. And I'll say this because I know him, but FISDO is not, not out to jam anybody. It's all about knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the more power you have, the more control you have. Um, so, you know, even when we say possible pilot deviation, that's not the end of the world. It could just be, hey, to let you know, you could have did this better or, you know, you kind of messed up, but, you know, we can work around it. So don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid. Controllers, we don't bite. Uh, like Wayman said, we used to do the tours and it was it was a pretty good thing because students felt a little more comfortable in the airplane once they saw that we weren't robots and, you know, err. but uh, as soon as the pandemic over, hopefully they'll open that back up. Um, and let people back upstairs. But we you know we're here to help. We're here to be a service, you know. Um, from the tower to Tracon to the center, you know, it's all one big, one big machine and we all work together. So even FISDO. <laughs> Nick, you're awfully quiet up there. Do you have any uh words for our viewers? Not really. I, they pretty much touched on it. If uh Definitely if, you know, I know sometimes like somebody mentioned, we speak fast, but if, if we speak fast, you know, uh, come back and tell us like, you need to repeat that more slowly, ask for clarification. Um, it's not, you know, it's, we're not robots, A, and it doesn't operate. Like every, every single day is different. Every single minute is different. So uh, if you're in the downwind, don't think that every time you're gonna turn base at seven miles, you could be seven, 10, eight, three, one, you never know. Um, so just keep that in mind as well, that, you know, sometimes, uh, as, you know, every time you, you take off, it's always gonna be different. So um, ask for clarification and ask questions. So keep you out of trouble, um, you know, especially if you don't understand something. So read back, hear back is another big issue that somebody said, so. Got two questions in the chat. Uh, somebody would like to know how they can attend the runway safety meeting at HWO. I have to admit, I haven't received a, an email or a link yet. That's online. It's going to be a uh, Zoom. I think Zoom. But um, I'll put my email in the um, chat and you email me. I'll send you the link. I'll send anybody the link that wants to come. 
I'll double down on that. Uh, if if anyone's following the North Perry Association's Facebook, MPACA's uh, Facebook, whenever I get the link, I'll share it on there. Unless it's not meant to be public. I think it is public. Right? It's, it's public, yes. Okay, great, great. And a question from George. Can ground or tower assist with transitions prior to takeoff? Can you request yes. a transition before you go? Um, transition to where? I think that's more a question uh, for Nick and the oh. uh, like the Fort Lauderdale International Transition. Oh, okay. I'm international transition. Can you ask for those you know, before you even take off? So it, I would say it's kind of difficult. Um, they can the tower can coordinate. Um, right. Definitely get your VFR squat code on the ground if you if you want to try that and make the request with them. They can coordinate and say, "Hey, this guy's coming out. He like the red road transition." Uh, the Fort Lauderdale one's easy, honestly. Uh, that one happens all day, every day. Uh, but it's a it's a red road transition that can be uh, a little more tricky. Um, so we can kind of anticipate if they call us up, we can say, yeah, it, it might be able to happen um, and give you a heads up so that way you're prepared for it. Um, but as far as getting the approval on the ground, uh, you know, you can't, can't quite get the class Bravo clearance while your wheels are still on the ground. You have to wait and talk to ATC for that. And from Perry, um, if you doing a low level transition of Lauderdale at below 500, um, we'll just put you on a VFR squat code and send you to Lauderdale Tower. But if you want to go over the top of Lauderdale, you have to contact Miami. So most of the time, um, we need a destination airport so we can put you for flight following that way and switch you to Miami, leaving Perry if you're going north. Yeah, it's something that I do recommend is uh, for VFR pilots to have basically two uh, uh, plans. Uh, plan A is what we're going to request. We're going to want to, uh, like Cedric said, we want to go a lot of north down 2,500 feet. And then once we clear FXC, climb up to 5,500 feet and go to Melbourne. Uh, that's plan A. Perfect. So we'll tell Perry Ground, hey, we're going to go to Melbourne today. We want flight following at 5,500 feet. And he'll put that light in the, uh, in the system. Cedric will give you a transponder code. So when you come off uh, the airport and, and appear on our radar scope, we see Melbourne, we see your requested altitude. And so one, two, three, let me departure, ident, radar contact. Take, so at this point you say, we would like to go midfield FLL 2,500 feet. And then, you know, we will, we will maneuver, uh, instruct as needed to get you to do that. As for the class Bravo transition to the South, um, same thing. <clears throat> Tell the uh, North Ferry Tower we want to go to Key West. We want to get a marathon, get flight following. And if you tell, uh, I guess the point of the question would be to inform ground that we want to do the Red Road transition to Planet. Cedric uh, has to push a button and call me uh, at the trade car. And he, it's a, it's a shot line. So he pushes a button. And he says, "Hey, Miami, this is North Perry on the 36 line." I got to listen for that and I might be busy. So it might take a couple of seconds for me to push the button and say, okay, Cedric, how can we help? And then Sarah's going to tell me, I got this plane here. He wants to do the red road transition. And I'm going to be like, yeah, uh, you know, everything changes by the second. When will that airplane depart? You know? And so it, it's just not a good time for, uh, for us to prosecute that request. Right. A definitely good way of planning it is tell Cedric, we want to go to Key West, 4,500 feet, 1,600 feet, whatever it may be. He'll put that in the system. Once you come off North Perry Airport, you will tag up on my screen. Cedric will tell you contact departure. And when you check in with departure, you say, Miami departure number one, two, three, four. We're just east of Perry at 1,000. We want to go to Key West, request Red Road transition. And I would throw in the, the altitude. We want to do it at 3,500 feet. And so a lot of this, you know, uh, comes down to traffic, complexity, weather. Can we do the Red Road? Because I'm not going to put you in a position if there's a, if there's a thunderstorm in Miami that I will turn you southbound because <clears throat> if you're climbing to 20 or to 3,500 feet and you say, I, I got stuck at 2,000 feet and I can't, I can't climb any higher, I got to be VFR. Well, if I have a go around because of the thunderstorm, they're going to be climbing to 3,000 feet and, and now it just became a conflict. We don't want that to happen. So, uh, you know, everything changes as the weather and the traffic picture progresses. But if we can approve it on a, a definite way is by exuding confidence to the controller. Hey, I know the procedure. We are with you. We want to do the red road at 3,500 feet. That's someone for me. That's someone that's, that's knowledgeable. He's already planned this out. He knows what he's got to do. And, and if traffic and weather permits, 
approved. That's the best way to, to, to do a red road transition uh, from Perry and the same thing from Tamiami or if you're coming south, you know, have a plan A. And if whatever happens, we can approve the red road, the class Bravo, have a plan B as a back. Very nice. Well, I, I just like to extend a personal thank you to everyone that's that's here on the panel. Uh, it, everyone goes above and beyond just your day jobs. Here you are, you know, on, on a Thursday evening, sharing your time with us. Uh, Cedric helping with the EA Young Eagles flights. Daron, you're like at every, uh, you know, uh, air festival <laughs> and thing like that. Uh, you know, sun and uh, fun, man. Yeah, sun and fun, and all the other ones at Opalaka. Uh, I really thank you guys for everything you do uh, outside your offices. And we would like to enjoy the name of the FA safety team to all, all of you which came tonight. We hope it was uh, our webinar proved to be educational, interesting, and enjoyable. Uh, we hope to see you again in our next webinar. And I want to thank for our volunteer speakers, Cedric, Nick, Dyron, and Eddie for doing so much with the Zoom and the question in everything around it. Thank you all for coming. Good night. Thanks everyone.